Uh, yeah, welcome. What a fantastic turnout. Um, oh. Some familiar faces and some not familiar faces. Welcome to Scary Success. <laughs> so, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Pete Store and I run the crowdfunding platform Greenlit.com. We are a dedicated crowdfunding platform We only deal with creative work. Be that music, be that theatre, be that gaming, and in particular film, is our specialist. Uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about where this evening came from. At Greenleaf, we've always been about trying to do something new with crowdfunding. Everybody knows crowdfunding, everybody knows Kickstarter, everybody knows Indiegogo. But they're very bland, commoditized platforms. They don't exist to help creative stuff. Their business is in products, it's in gadgets, it's in luggage, all those kind of things. What we do at Greenlit is we specialize purely in creative stuff because we understand that the difference between an audience and a consumer is, is very, very different. Crowdfunding and fundraising in general, when you are a creative artist in whatever genre, in whatever format, it's about understanding your audience. It's about getting to know your audience and it's about getting them genuinely engaged and genuinely passionate about what we're doing. So a few months ago, I met with Alex and Keir. So they gave a fantastic round of applause and rightly so because they were precisely the sort of filmmakers that I set this business up to work with. Dedicated, enthusiastic, in love with their genre uh, and they have had a string of phenomenal shorts both uh, in the horror genre and, and indeed with portrait outside, a very provocative drama. So they came to us to fund their feature film Kill Your Lover. It's being made at the right budget, and I have no doubt that what they're going to do is going to be absolutely sensational. They know their craft, they know their trade. So the question was, what can we do more? What can we do to go beyond crowdfunding as a payment platform, as you know, as, as a sort of version of PayPal? And it's really about building community that encompasses filmmakers, that encompasses audience, that encompasses that whole community enthusiasm for, for seeing stuff gestate and be made and be released and, and taken out into the world. I started Greenlit because I guess I've always felt of myself as a little bit of an outsider. You know, I was turned down from the National Film School. I was never going to get that internship at the BFI or, or the Film Council or Creative England or, or any of those kind of establishment places. So for me, crowdfunding was, was a way to hustle. It was a way to operate and to do your creative thing outside those parameters. It's a place where you don't have to ask for people's permission. You don't have to ask permission from those gatekeepers. How can you do it yourself? And to my mind, there's always been something very outsidery about the horror genre. We are seeing, you know, it's becoming fashionable, it's becoming respectable in a way that perhaps it hasn't been previously, but it's always been that slightly kooky part of the film world that operates by its own rules. Alex and Kiss film has a very punk ethos as well, a very punk heavy soundtrack. If you go to uh, Greenlit site, you can listen to their Kill Your Love a Punk playlist. And for me, a great inspiration was, was the way the punk movement kicked off, how you know you could put on a gig in a squat and pick up your guitars and you know it might be a bit rough and you might have got your guitar from Woolworths and you might be the most <laughs> developed virtuoso player but with energy and enthusiasm and talking to the community and getting people really on board that's the, probably the most exciting place and the most exciting thing that music can ever be. So the horror genre is, is a lot like that and what I wanted to do tonight is have a kind of a state of the nation discussion. Um, we've got an absolutely fantastic panel, I'll take you through in a minute. But it was a state of, a state of the nation discussion on where's horror at at the moment. You know, we've, we've seen some very high profile films, things like Censor, things like Dashcam, things like Host, are doing very well. Um, 
But what does it mean? You know, what does it mean for trying to get stuff made? What are people watching? How can we get stuff out to audiences? How can we get stuff funded and, and created? And that's kind of what we're going to be talking about tonight in, in very broad terms. Um, fantastic panel, but I also want to be very, very open and receptive to the audience too. Who's a film major in the audience? Um, you know, phenomenal. So I want everybody to talk about what they're doing, talk about the problems they're facing, and as a community and as a group, we'll kick around some solutions and, and who knows, you know, maybe maybe we can come up with something that will help you get your stuff made, get it out there. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to this illustrious panel. Um, so first of all, right here, we have Giles Alderson. <laughs> Known for his footballing skills. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. His podcast, of course, and I'm delighted that this will be going out as, as a special episode on, on the Filmmakers podcast, which I'll be a huge fan of right from the get-go. But Giles is always also a fantastic horror head. Um, he makes films in that genre, and he'll tell you about that very shortly. Next up, um, who here has heard of Fright Fest? <laughs> <laughs> A four day orgy. Five. 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 It has blood, it has terror, it has lust, it has all the sort of things. And atop the throne, the horned one, the Baphomet <laughs> of Fright Fest, <laughs> is Paul McElroy. Next up, we have the documentarist, the writer, and huge horror head, and one of the leading experts on the fantastic genre of found footage. <laughs> we'll be, I'm sure we'll be talking very much about how those that subgenre is working at the moment. Um, Sarah Appleton. <laughs> a filmmaker, and very, very interestingly, a distributor and sales agent Again, very, very immersed in the genre. Um, we'll be hearing more about, about Julian's part. Julian Richards, we'll be hearing more about Julian's part. <laughs> I think it's going to be absolutely fascinating to see some market insight and, and to see what's, you know, what's going on and what works. And so that's going to be really, really interesting. <laughs> some years ago, <laughs> bursting through the chest of the UK horror scene with the absolutely Thrillingly bonkers. Switchblade smile. Razorblades. Razorblades. <laughs> <Blades. laughs> <laughs> Razorblades. Sorry, they're Switchblade films and we're Razorblades. Switchblade cinema. Switchblade. Oh, we're we're cinema. <laughs> Say that last five times. <laughs> Follow it up with the probably even more intense and equally bonkers Evil Aliens. <laughs> Woo! Woo! And I, I, I regret to have not seen it, but also Doghouse. Uh, and now a very, very illustrious uh, and storied documentary maker and also operator of the exploitation DVD label Nucleus. Mr. Jack West. And finally, I'm going to introduce them as, as one unit because they direct as AK. It's Alex and Kaya. So, so I'm going to go down the panel, and I'm going to ask first of all, what's the origin story, and what is special about the horror genre to you? You know, why are you all here? Why are you doing what you do? Don't. By the way, Pete, that was great. Actually, that was really well. Oh, well done, buddy. Um, I, I, do you know what? It's I know, I meant that. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, it's not at all. That's what I'm saying. Um, I, I love horror. I always have. I've been shit scared of horror for so, so many years. I, I, I ran away from it for so long when I was a kid. Literally, I, was, I didn't want to watch horror. It was only when I started being in them and then making them that that whole side for me just became incredible. And just the, the fans, the people who love it, and I just totally fell in love with this 
amazing genre and I'm so glad it's been successful at the moment. I'm so glad that it's coming back in a big way and so many filmmakers can get out there now with their horror films for very low budgets and make a noise. And it's been proven in the last couple of years. So um, that's why I love horror. Um, Doctor Who, <laughs> when I was very small, and um, seeing Don't Look Now, Nicholas Rowe's picture when I was probably too young to watch it, it scared me to tears and still scares me to this day. And the only thing I disagree on with you guys is horror isn't in fashion at the moment. It's always been in fashion. It's <laughs> always been amazing at the box office. Look at Rosemary's Baby, Exorcist. Blair Witch, etc., etc., etc. So it's not in vogue, it's not in fashion, it's here to stay, it always will be, always has been. Yeah, uh, when I was eight, I watched The Evil Dead 2. That was the first horror film I ever seen. Um, thanks, my dad. And, um, and, and when I was 10, I was completely traumatized by The Ring, uh, the American version, sadly, not the Japanese one. Um, Completely traumatized me, and I think from then on, you just uh, you think how how why do people want to be scared? And I think that the fact that it's so easy to you know go out there and make something that you don't necessarily need to, to be greenlit by a studio or something, and you can really scare the pants off of people. I think that that's what's great about it. Yeah, well, I I sort of grew up um, watching. Horror Double Bills on the BBC um, initially, um, of course, Doctor Who, um, and then, but uh, you know, with with feature films, it it, it was to a degree the BBC that uh, uh, um, nurtured my my fascination with the genre, um, with uh, the Universal classics, um, and then the Hammer films. Um, so this this was really my my diet, my my weekend diet uh, as a child. Um, and my dad had a Super 8 camera, so um, um, watching those films, buying House of Hammer magazine and Fangoria, and then using my dad's Super 8 camera to make my own horror films um, on the weekends with my chums from school, um, just really created a you know a horror fan, um, and uh, you know sort of a, an ultra horror fan with me. And then I went to film school, and um, and I think one of the, the things I realised at film school is that. If there's one genre where the language of cinema can be used, you know, in in extraordinary and exciting ways, it is it is through through the horror genre, you know, and uh, not just horror but suspense. If you think of Hitchcock, for example, um, uh, it, you know, it has its roots in in cinematic language. Um, so for me, I mean, the genre is also you know thinking again as a film student. It's like it's a way of dealing with. Um, Certain issues in life, anxieties, concerns, but um, y you know, but doing it sort of metaphorically um, instead of doing it through social realism. So it's it's a more sort of artistic approach, d a, d a different way of of interpreting our existential issues. I've got one. Oh, I've got one. <laughs> um, I was uh, lucky enough to be a teenager in the eighties, so <laughs> so I, I really got a really great wave of insane horror films coming on with video, and obviously I then did that documentary about video nasties. But the great thing about horror movies is that they very much were about projecting your imagination into things, and it's it's your imagination I think which scares you mostly. And I think there's that really interesting thing about watching a horror film is is you're actually in a safe space watching it but you can be frightened. And I think there's a thrill to that, which you don't get from other genres. So I've, I always like that. And for me, because I was, I was no good at music, so I had to do something. So I thought maybe, yeah, I love uh, filmmaking was something that I fell in love with. And I started making films on video, um, like video cameras were coming out. Like, so I made my first stuff in like 1987 on video with my mates and just got, a bit, got into it like that. Then went to film school and all the rest of it. But, but horror is the thing which, I think I really enjoy watching people watch a horror film. And if you can get a reaction from people, then that you, as a filmmaker, that's really interesting. And I, I like that. And I guess that's why I love horror. 
Um, I really wish I had a cool answer, but uh, unfortunately, uh, the way that I got into horror was uh, a f I was at a friend's house and uh, it was a change of the channel. We came across uh, Return of the Living Dead Part 2, not even Part 1, Part 2. And uh, after about five minutes, I got so freaked out and just begged him to change the channel uh, that basically he made fun of me for the rest of the night. And I always felt like so lame because of that. So I feel like basically I, I made a, a promise to myself that I was never going to let a movie like freak me out so much that I couldn't finish watching it. So I like inoculated myself for years going, no, 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 I don't care how much this scares me. I'm going to watch the whole thing. Uh, so yeah. And then I think I just became fascinated by the way that like horror can be this kind of just real visceral experience. And I always loved the way that like when Sam Raimi made uh, drag me to hell, he talked about it as like, he wanted to make the cinematic equivalent of a ghost train. It's like just a ride. And so when I made my short wretch, that was kind of like, that was always the, the intent in, in the intention was to make like a ride and a visceral experience. I think that's what always really appeals to me about the horror genre. Hello. Um, I have a slightly different approach, I guess, because I was basically abducted to Switzerland. No, that's a joke. I wasn't actually abducted, um, but I was transported to Switzerland by my parents. And it's kind of the equivalent of living under a rock, pop culture wise. And I don't really feel like I came across the things that I'm interested in now. So I wasn't exposed to it, but I did find my, my way in via manga and anime because that became like a huge craze. Um, and I was like the only one who would like buy mangas at this comic store. And it's only like once I met Kira actually that I realized how much horror I'd actually ingested because I was like, oh yeah, you know, I don't really like slashes. I don't really like jump scares. And he's like, that's not horror. It's like a whole spectrum. And like basically as of my twenties, I've just like been having my eyes opened to like all the stuff that's around and it's just been amazing. And I'm like the expression within horror and there's just something there for everyone. And as others have said as well, just like, the creative cinematic freedom of that as well. And just actually making people feel things is something that's very important to me. And I, I like feeling as well. So it's just great to be part of the community. Set of responses. I, I just, I just drop in my um, birth into the, my death and rebirth was growing up in Bournemouth in the 1980s. Uh, it wasn't a lot of art house cinema, but my art house was Alex Cox's movie drone series and the most pivotal screen in that was when I saw The Wicker Man for the first time and that's a film that had a very very long lasting effect on me to the point where I was actually looking for yellow roll necks on eBay so I'm going <laughs> to post this dress as Lord Summer Isle but you're, it's a bit warm so I'm quite glad I got rid of that suit right there. So just to pick up on Paul's comment, absolutely correct, yes of course. Um, some horror films have been some of the biggest box office successes and even more so they have been some of the most profitable films ever. So I'm interested in what the panel thinks about how distribution mechanisms work. So, so by which I mean what would it take for a horror film like say Blair Witch Project um, something made on a modest budget, what characteristics, what fortune, what business aspects would have to happen for us to see the next Blair Witch Project? Something that will really burst out, capture the popular imagination and becomes very, very profitable having been made on a modest budget. Let's, let's ask everybody in the panel, what, what do they think? I think we should go for Julian first. Well, let's go for Julian first, yes, more. absolutely. Let's do that. Uh, yeah, well, you know, it's um, when you think of films like Blair Witch and uh, um, Paranormal Activity, for example, these were independent films um, that were made outside of the studio system. Um, uh, a, a lot of successful horror films are made by the studios. Um, so what they have, you know, to their advantage is, um, is uh, P&A. They have huge marketing um, abilities, you know, so the film might cost... A, you know, a couple of million to make, but they'll spend 20 million on the first week of theatrical, and then 80 million to run it over to a second week. So uh, you can see what you're up against. You know that um, if you're a, a little independent coming in with a hundred grand film, how how can you compete with that? You can't. But occasionally, um, you'll get a, every, every seven years or so, you'll get a breakthrough like Blair Witch, like Paranormal Activity, that gets picked up by a studio. 
So how does that happen? How do you get picked up by a studio? Well, one of the routes to getting that kind of attention is through the film festival circuit. Um, so um, uh, you probably need to uh, premiere your film at um, Toronto, Midnight Madness, maybe Sundance, maybe Tribeca, maybe South by Southwest, but ultimately it's those two. It's, it's, it's Toronto and, um, and, and Sundance. I believe Paranormal Activity was picked up by Paramount Vantage in Toronto. And then they sat on it for three years whilst they basically remade it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but um, at, at, at this point, I, I should sort of hand over to Jake because Jake made a film that was selected for Toronto, okay. um, which is an incredible achievement. So he might have some stories about that. Um, well, I think, yeah, we ha my film Evil Aliens went to Toronto Midnight Madness, which is, yeah, an amazing, uh, an amazing experience as a filmmaker. I mean, any festival you go to is an amazing experience as a filmmaker because it's a chance to see your film with an audience. But Midnight Madness is insane because it really is mad in the sense of it was two, the audience was 2,000 people and it turned up at the screen and literally, I mean, you know, like an old photos of like sort of Star Wars, you see queues around the block. It was like that, and it was my film. And it's like bloody hell, this is a, like this is a film I've made for fuck all. And it's uh, <laughs> sorry, I don't know if you can swear on this, but um, yeah. So it, that that kind of exposure was really interesting. But we had already been picked up by they'd already done a deal with Content Film at that point for the UK that did the the producer. So it was financed by one financier, and we had already had a deal. So. It, it didn't blow up in the sense of, say, a paranormal activity because we didn't have an American studio attached. But it meant that I got a chance to talk to a lot of the kind of bigger distribution companies like um, the Ghost House Pictures, wanted to have a meeting, and Plan B, Brad Pitt's company. So it's a chance of, it was a chance to be noticed by people. But it's always like they're always, they're, they're always just sort of trying to find out, well, what's next? And, Stuff like that, but in the end, but I was doing a film for the Sci Fi Channel next, so it wasn't really probably the best move, <laughs> like retrospectively thinking. But for me, it was like one of the first times I ever got paid properly to make a film, so it seemed like a good idea. But it's actually the film I'm least proud of. So, you know, those swings and roundabouts of, you, of your career, because you don't really know what's going to happen. So, from the perspective of as a filmmaker, though, Julian is absolutely right get your films into festivals because that's the place where they're going to get seen and you're going to get noticed. So, the, the real key to any successful film, though, is is your story has to be good and unique and it has to have something in it that people want to see. So that, your job as a filmmaker is to concentrate on getting your story as you want it, not as other people want it. Because if you're trying to make a film for a distributor, then you're, then you're being told what to do. And that's the problem I had on the Sci-Fi Channel film. From being completely independent on Evil Aliens, I had a, a rule book given me to say you can't have swearing, you can't have sex, you can't have drug use, bloody, bloody, blah, blah, which kind of ruined my filmmaking in many ways. <laughs> <laughs> so, so be aware of that. So, but get the platform and then tr then try and exploit it. But hopefully, a bit better than I did when I was in that situation. Yeah, I mean, it it, it, it definitely is a case where you know uh, I've made nine nine feature films, and um, the two that I made myself on a micro budget are the two that I've enjoyed the most making and uh, the two that have sort of been most successful. What I will say about the whole um, Toronto Midnight Madness, I was there with you, Jake. Remember? What, what good times are there? Um, Colin Geddes, who used to program it, one of, one of my closest friends, and Peter Kaplowski, who runs Midnight Madness now, they only have nine slots. So your film has to play at midnight 30, because that's when it starts, and go on till 2.30 in the morning, and then a QA and a at 3 a.m. So your film has to be absolutely top-notch. Otherwise, people are going to be falling asleep, walking out, blah, blah, blah. Um, we at Fright Fest have got much more um, screening slots, I think, this year, although we haven't announced it, and we just had the lineup today finalized. It's like 70 or 80 pictures. Can you imagine, as a film festival programmer, if you can only select nine films out of the th hundreds that you're gonna get sent. It would drive me fucking mental. Um, because they're all like my, my children, my, my babies, that I wanna look after and nurture. So at Fryfest, we had the early works by everybody from 
Guillermo to Chris Nolan to whoever, Jay Quest, etc., etc. So we're allowed that bit more flexibility, a bit like Fantasia, which is another great festival in um, Montreal in Canada. And they're over three or four weeks. Can you imagine what Fright Fest would be like over three or four weeks? <laughs> I'd be a wreck, more than a wreck than what I usually am. Um, or Sitges, which is also an amazing festival, which is in Spain, and that's in October. And they have the brilliance of having 120 features that they can select so if you s submit to toronto midnight madness don't be downhearted he only has nine slots so that's all i'll say and also um if you're going to make a film it's all about the idea it's not about the budget it's about the idea and that's where blair witch and paranormal which is the boring things to mention all the time because you know they're the breakout they're the breakout um hits but those films had it wasn't about the budget it was about the idea and the idea costs nothing but it takes a lot to come up with that idea i uh, uh do you want to I'll just say quickly, I'm, I'm actually going to steal somebody else's thing that I heard at another Q&A, um, because obviously I haven't had a film uh, at a you know big festival, so you know I'm, I'm going to rip off people who did. Uh, but uh, Paul was actually really awesomely put together a screening recently of The Endless and Spring by uh, Aaron Benson, sorry, Justin Benson and Aaron Moorhead, who are two guys that I'm fucking obsessed with. Um, Low key, just like want to be friends with them so badly. Um, but, but like come, no. Come to Fright Fest in August, you'll be fine. Oh, I don't know. Is this, are you are you letting us in on something? You tell me. Oh. <laughs> but no, but um, they said they had a Q and A. I did. They didn't ask. They didn't answer my question. I put my hand up, and they didn't. They, <laughs> They didn't answer it. Uh, anyway, um, point is, one of the things that they said, which was really fascinating, is they were basically like, you know, if you're making something on a low budget, everyone kind of says to you, you know, make something commercial. But the thing is, if you're making something commercial, then ultimately, you know, you're competing against things that are like five, ten million dollars that you can't compete with. So instead, you're actually better making something that's more idiosyncratic, creative, interesting, because it'll cut through. And even if it's not the biggest runaway hit, you know, you build off of that and you make more things. And it's like, I mean, hey, I'm still talking talking about spring obsessed with it and it's one of the major influences of what we're trying to do now so i mean you know there's really something in that in being like leading with creativity rather than just a pure commercial instinct yeah i, I totally want to follow up what you said um it is really about creativity and it is really about festivals but you know we have to not forget that we live in a digital age where you can get things out there to people um if you do it the right way. And um, has anybody seen the short film Lights Out, like as an example? Yeah. I think, I mean, that was a brilliant short and so brilliant that um, James Wan saw it and took the director over to LA to make the feature. And now he's made Shazam and like Annabelle creation and all this other stuff. So at the end of the day, as long as you have a really good idea and you're really good at what you do, you should be able to find a way. Yeah, I totally agree. Totally agree with that. And and going back to the festival thing, my debut movie, The Dare, got picked up at Popcorn Frights. Hence why I'm wearing this uh, T-shirt today, because it, it was a place where we had distributors there. They were they were going to see films. And when you get into these festivals, which I believe Alex, you uh, okay, we can't say that. <laughs> okay, um, uh, with festivals like that, when you do get in, you d it's so important to go. It's so important to be there if you can, show your face, make sure the programmers know that you're turning up. But also just by having your film shown there makes such a difference. And we got offers from showing at Popcorn Fright straight away. And I'm sure it happens at all the best of the other festivals as well. And I'm, I'm sure Paul will fill you in on all the Fright Fest successes, but how important it is to be there and show face, it's really important. Yes, absolutely. And for those of you that are interested, we've got two sessions on our YouTube channel from Katie McCulloch of Festival Formula. And she iterates very, very much what Giles just said about the significance and the importance of actually being there and pressing the flesh and talking to people about what your work and not merely the film that's playing. Um, it's absolutely invaluable. And I'm delighted that in-person film festivals are coming back. I'm delighted. It was kind of the, kind of the rationale between having an in-person event tonight as well. So that's the strategy. If if you want to have a smash hit, you're going to need a studio or a studio-sized backing in in your P and A. Um, you know, again, the, the examples we, we were talking about. You don't necessarily you think of them 
in terms of their craft and being very independent, you don't necessarily think of them having that studio heft behind them. Um, this is always a challenge because very many filmmakers say, well, you know, I'm going to make my film and then it'll get into Sundance and I'm not Miramax anymore, but somebody will pick it up and away we go, Hollywood, here we come. But obviously that's very challenging, you know, um, nine slots in Midnight Madness. What are some alternative paths? So, you know, Sarah, you mentioned alternative aspects of distribution. Um, what are the panels seeing in terms of, you know, different paths for films? Um, be that independent releasing, who are the who are the effective distributors in this country for, for small films? Um, and I thought... We'll, we'll talk about streaming in a minute because I think that's a different question. But what are some alternative paths if, if you if you're sitting on something you've made and you haven't you know set one of the major festivals on fire? What 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 else could you do with it? Well, off the record, um, we've got a film um, which I saw a very early, very very rough cut of um, just the other day, which is going to be amazing. Um, and I programmed it for Halloween, the Fright Fest Halloween gig, which is two days, Leicester Square, 10 new films, blah, blah, blah. Their strategy is to go out with, in their opinion, the three key festivals worldwide. Then they are going to self-distribute. So after we've premiered it and after another festival's premiered it, they're going to actually, um, it's not a UK-based uh, production, um, they're going to reap the rewards of the festival exposure and reviews and the word of mouth and the buzz and the Twitter and Facebook. And they're actually gonna, they're gonna bypass distribs entirely and they're gonna sell straight to the fan. So that's just one example of how possibly you can bypass the, the studio system circuit. Because as Julian said, the, the P&A for um, press and advertising basically is, is what that means. Um, where you've got something like Doctor Strange or Jurassic or Top Gun, which are flooding all the cinemas. You know, you try and go and see a movie, you try and see Men, and it's showing once, if you're lucky. Or you go and see Northman, it might be showing once, if you're lucky. Or Black Phone is doing quite well, but it's still only on very limited screens. And that's because the press and advertising spend of somebody like Disney to promote Jurassic or Top Gun or whatever, it's Sw swamping the market so anybody trying to release independently uh, genre or any other genre in the UK is going to catch a cold if you spend 50,000 quid on your brand new feature which is a think piece which is a romantic comedy you've directed really well Kermode loves it good old Marky and but it ain't going to translate to people bums on seats so because everybody's going to see Jurassic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, why would I spend if I was distributing your picture, twenty or fifty grand, or more, because it's not going to reap the returns? That's it. I mean, I I, I semi agree with it, but um, but in reality, um, uh, digital distribution is a rabbit hole. And it's becoming increasingly a rabbit hole. The, you know, when when you look at how it's evolving, it, it's it's really difficult to know how to navigate it. It's even it's even difficult to know how where to find your film on what platform. I mean, it's 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 absolutely insane. Um, and therefore, it takes um, a level of expertise to know the landscape. Um, and it also takes um, a level of expertise in marketing. Um, and probably a budget in marketing to actually get um, uh, the audience to uh, to watch the film. And the reality is the way that uh, digital distribution is evolving is that the audience don't want to watch your film unless they're getting it for free. Transactional VOD, which basically is taken over from physical DVD, is over. Um, Netflix SVOD is under threat from AVOD. To be an AVOD is the future, but that's that's only because your film is for free and you're getting a share of the of, of the advertising revenue, and um, and it means that the revenue that you're getting is is sort of getting less and less and less, which is really you know um, uh, 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 complicated to you know how 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 can you 
you know, you can't keep on making your films for less money in less time. It, it, it's it's um, it's it's a self defeating kind of prophecy in a way. Um, so um, where horror struggles here is that in order to cut through that and get some traction on digital, you need cast. Horror has always survived as the genre that doesn't require cast. But on digital, you need cast to get the traction. Plus, the digital landscape is somewhat conservative. So um, certain kinds of horror can struggle to even get accepted by the platforms because the platforms are, are, are like, oh, that's too violent, or that's too bloody. And you can see that with the way that they're dealing with trailers. They, they won't allow you to use that trailer because it's not family friendly. So it, it's uh, so instead they show you know a sort of a an opaque uh, a sample scene from the film. Um, so it's getting it's getting really really tricky. So I, I I sort of would say I mean there was a zombie film that was made um, uh, maybe about ten years ago that did self distribution um, and it was like a zombie film in the back of a car. I can't remember the title. Um, and they 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 went into the market with that same, yes, exactly, yeah, the the battery. The battery. They went into into the market with ex exactly that same strategy, and I don't think it worked out because at the end of the day, you need somebody like me that knows the market, um, <laughs> you know, and and <laughs> and and who is not going to rip you off. <laughs> <laughs> But what, but what Julian's saying there about having some money for your marketing spend is actually really important. And a lot of, especially when you're trying to make a, an independent horror film, which is probably you on absolutely zero money, you're not thinking about the end game, but it's actually really important because to get eyeballs on it, even if you're going into forums, even if you're putting, a, I don't know, 400 quid onto um, uh, Facebook advertising, again, be very careful with all that and know what you're doing before you jump into it. But it's, it can be done and you can find an audience, but you have to maybe tap into all that beyond the forums beforehand. Make sure you're talking to the right people. Be in the places where horror fans love to watch films. And if you're in there talking to them way in advance, well, they might pay attention and watch your trailer and they might actually buy it. But as uh, Julian says, they'll probably want it for free. So we have to think outside the box of new ways to do it now. Um, I think it is difficult because we're in a sort of really lazy situation now where people will have their subscriptions to things like Amazon and Netflix and Shudder. Um, for horror and so and they'll just watch what goes on that so at the end if you're trying to you know I'm conflicting with my own argument now but uh, uh, it's just difficult if you want to market yourself the, the reason people like Julian exist is because it's it's really hard to get the word out about your own film uh, yeah I, I mean you could say that the market is so bad right right now that if you end it if you do it yourself you're going to end up with roughly the same as if you did it through a sales agent or a distributor. Uh, because whatever the difference is, the sales agent or distributor is going to spend on marketing it. So, so that would be the argument. However, your film will get much more um, uh, better placement and, and better marketing and better representation for your next film if you do it through the proper channels. If you do it independently, you'll, you'll just become and you know, an even bigger outsider. Um, at, at some stage, you have to engage with the sales and distribution industry. But also, as a filmmaker, it's so important to learn that business side of what's going on so that you do understand that paperwork. But it's so true to have a team behind you selling your film rather than you. It's, it's ball breaking, it's really hard. And then you end up not making your next film because you're spending so long promoting that film and everyone heard about it a year ago. So it is that swings around about. So if you can get in with a great distributor like Julian, uh, then definitely, definitely do it. It's so important. Jake, how was your experience oh. getting your films into distribution? Well, it's a fucking conundrum, isn't it? You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know it's, it's as clear as mud how to get your film released, you know. Um, I think the, the only thing that I've found is, is that my approach is I make the film that I want to make and I believe that people want to watch it. And the only way you're going to get your film seen and released by more people is if there's enough people that want to see it. So if the film's good enough, then you'll get bigger companies potentially interested in your film. 
if it's not good enough, then it may be that it, you, it won't ever get seen. And I think part of the problem was when I started, when I first started making movies, I think that like in one year when you had to shoot on film, uh, so Razor Blade Smile was like, we shot it in uh, 1996. Um, so I think that year, if you look at the BFI handbook, there was like about, I think, 17 British feature films being yeah. made. So I think that's one of the biggest difference. D D Digital is brilliant because it means that we can all make films in this room and we don't need loads of money. So everyone in, everyone in here can be a filmmaker. But when I did a panel in like 1998, you put how many filmmakers in the audience? It would be about maybe one or two because mm -hmm. it was so hard to make a movie back then. So that meant you had a, it, was an, it was an easier stab to get recognized, I think. So now I think it's the sheer volume of work coming through, which means that it's harder for that work to be seen because everyone's got something, everyone's trying to hustle, but what's, how, do you, how do you make something that stands out? And I think your job as a filmmaker, the only thing that you really want to concentrate on is to make your film how you want it to be. And it's kind of in the lap of the gods whether that's going to connect with people or not. But I think as a filmmaker, you want to just concentrate on what you're doing and not worry too much about marketing teams and all this bullshit because that won't make your film good. That's the way I would. That's the way I, I sort of look at it. Yeah. Very good. Very 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 interesting. Um, I mean, when we bring on a crowdfunding project, we try and give filmmakers artists a lot of advice on how to do marketing and it's almost like a dirty word i mean i, I teach marketing um entertainment film marketing at, at some universities and some film schools and it is almost like people recoil at the word because they think it's synonymous with selling they think it's synonymous with with you know kind of stathlets flats red braces and and you know that that kind of thing but it's very very much about knowing your audience and understanding your audience and that's why i have a suspicion that, that the horror community might be more receptive um now obviously there are some specific streaming platforms shudder is is obviously the very big one uh and the horror channel which i believe is called something else as of this week um and also actually interestingly Mobi seem to be buying some quite a lot of well i mean movie buying everything at the moment but they seem to be buying quite a lot of elevated in quotation marks um horror as well what about what what, what experience does everybody have of those kind of more specific platforms um i don't mind starting just because i recently just got my film on shadow which is cool um played at fright fest last year Thanks. um the the thing about that is you i guess you really, you have to get it in front of Shudder and they're gonna be at festivals or, you know, watching stuff that people they know have recommended. So unless you know someone at Shudder, you have to play at a festival that someone from Shudder is gonna watch a film at. Um, there's, I don't really know if there's any other way. So um, apart from that, that's, that's how we did it. We played at Fright Fest and then we played at Fantastic Fest and then Sitches and then, you know, Shudder well, Shudder had already bought it, actually, but <laughs> <laughs> but um, the point, you know, you get what I'm saying. So there's not really a way to circumvent that unless you just know people who work at Shudder. So mm -hmm. I don't know. What do you think? I mean, um, Shudder um, are a great company. Um, I think there's three key players there. You know, it's a small company. Um, they pick up about 43 films a year. So, and they've, they're highly curated. They have a very specific agenda the, the 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 stuff that they're looking for is is very specific there's a lot of stuff i mean i've sold you know i've, I've i represent 150 films and I've, I've probably sold about five films to shudder um so that's quite selective isn't it uh so yes yes so so it's it's like in a way it's like getting into toronto midnight madness it's it's, it's a very small shelf space and you're very lucky if you get in there um because if you don't get in there then you're you're reliant on selling all those territories that Shudder are in independently distributed by distributor the old fashioned way. Um, uh, but there are um, rivals to Shudder now. The Cynodyme uh, have bought Screenbox and they've teamed up with Bloody Disgusting and they're looking to, to compete with Shudder. Um, and, um, uh, you know, there's going to be more of this kind of, you know, evolution in the, in the digital space where, where, 
where the opportunities in horror are going to you know increase hopefully exponentially you know and uh, um, so um, I think one of the things about horror is that it, it always performed very well on physical on on yes. on DVD you know and now with the demise of DVD um, uh, the the digital space has become quite quite sort of tricky. It is is horror does horror work for the digital space? Well, it does through a, a curated platform like Shudder, but um, but otherwise, you know, as, as I've said, you you really do need something, some element, some ingredient in your film to attract the mainstream audience. Because horror works because it's it has a loyal fan base, but the loyal fan base is small; it's niche, so it doesn't have a lot of value. Yeah, you know, it has it has it, its value is um, reliable. It's always going to be there. But it's not much. <laughs> so as long as you make your film for not much, then it's going to work within that space. Um, but how do you sort of break out of that towards something more mainstream? And, um, and the only way you can do it is with cast. And thinking creatively, I think stunt casting, for example. I, I met um, Anthony Waller in Cannes uh, last month. who made a film called Mute Witness. And he um, was in, living in Germany at the time um, and was working for an advertising company. And he had this project, Witness, that he was hoping to make. And he heard that um, um, Sir Alec Guinness was attending a film festival in Munich. So he, he, he persuaded Alec Guinness to come to an underground car park <laughs> and shoot a scene for the film. <laughs> um, and uh, he inserted that scene into the film Several years later, after yep. he had made it, and this, the, you know, this was a film starring Sir Alec Guinness. So, so you need you need something like that yes. to to sell your film. Stunt casting is is definitely a good way to go. Okay, that's. I mean, that's that's really fascinating to hear. Yes, stunt casting we we know all about uh, in in other genres, but it's interesting that it have, would potentially have that kind of cut through as well. Um, AK. You've got your shorts onto different platforms, haven't you? I'm bloody disgusting TV. Uh, <laughs> what platforms have you been working with with your shorts output and how have they been to deal with? I mean, it's it's an interesting one because I think it's kind of like moved and changed quite a bit. So, you know, it's like I'm sure everybody here has had like dealings with Alter, or dealings with um, Crypt TV, you know, and they kind of go through various like states. And I think one of the problems, it's interesting what you're saying about the, uh, the um, censorship of things because... Um, that's kind of been a big problem with uh, YouTube in terms of um, a lot of those platforms that I think people were kind of hoping would branch out into bigger things with the horror genre. And I think like as YouTube's like cut back more on violence and stuff like that, it's meant it's a lot more difficult for some of that stuff. So, I mean, um, I think um, I think, yeah, I mean, there are platforms for shorts. Um, but I think one of the interesting things is, as you're saying about the kind of the the expansion of the digital world, is shorts are kind of becoming more and more meaningless because kind of everybody can make a short, and kind of everybody like the thing is like if you're on a, you know, a, a you know a 15 year old with a phone can like get like a million views for you know cool shit their dog does and you know i love looking at that you know and it's like and you know that's the reality is more likely to look at that than i am like you know somebody's like horror short that they just post on youtube so you know i think that's the weird thing is i think like micro budget shorts are kind of become some micro budget features are kind of becoming the new short films they're kind of becoming mm -hmm. the gateway thing you need in order to actually make any kind of traction because they take some kind of like more uh investment than say like something like a short film does nowadays um, I don't know if that answered your question. Do you want to? Do you want to take over? You're, you're smarter than me. It's okay. No, I just want to like follow on from it. I guess is like what I would stress is that we obviously think there's a lot of value in shorts themselves. We've made way too many of them ourselves, um, but I do think it's a great way to learn. But I think that what we've talked about a lot recently is this idea that you used to have to shoot on film, and that meant it was hard to have to be a proof of concept type short, and that was in and of itself cost prohibitive for a lot of people. And now it's less cost prohibitive, which is great because we can practice more. But I think in terms of really putting that thought in a little bit like with animation, I would say animation is really hard to put together. So animation shorts 
end up do still being that proof of concept, I guess. So it just depends on the medium. Um, and then to answer your question, yes, uh, Wretch is on Bloody Disgusting TV, The Bloody Bites, and then Alter as well. And um, But I know that with Crypt TV, for instance, they're, I think what they're doing and their business has shifted massively. And I think there's a lot that's happened due to the pandemic as well, and everything's just changed. So what we say today might not be true tomorrow, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? So it's just good to keep on top of it. And I think what you were saying about just getting on top of that business acumen is really important. It's definitely something I'm looking into because you are kind of expected to do it all. Um, Actually, Alex, can I ask, because on that front, when you have your films on these platforms, they're short films, do you, is there any revenue that comes back to you or is it completely just a platform for you to get your work out there? So it really depends. And I think it's changed over the years, depending on the platform. For us specifically on one of them, there was a licensing fee where they paid us like a, a, a lump sum and then they were like, right, this is ours. And we've got a six month sort of like thing on developing it into a feature if we want to. Um, and then with one of the other ones, it was just a collaboration um, where they were like, this is, you know it's going to our audience so that's sort of payment in and of itself um and yeah we haven't been on one i think omeletto sort of do like a omeletto sort of like a bigger youtube channel that do do all kinds of films including horror shorts as well and i think they do more of the uh pay-per-view you get sort of 50 percent of it or something i might be yeah i might be wrong on that it's just my general understanding um but then you know five ten years ago i think those structures were different. So I feel like everyone's dealt with those businesses in a different way. And, and I do think, you know, Alex is really right in the fact that, it, you know, these things are constantly changing. So, you know, we had Wretch go up on Alter and then we got immediately contacted by another platform that was really, oh, we wish we got in Wretch. We, you know, we, we, we love your work. We'd really like to you to pitch to make a, a short film for our platform so you know we pitched them did great they were like yeah no this is like the best pitch we've ever had <laughs> humble brag um and 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 we so we were like yeah oh, really jazz we're gonna make this kind of like uh you know 10 minute slasher film because i i love slasher movies so i was like really like excited for it and um just six months went by and we email them be like so when can we start production they're like oh we're just getting the legal papers in part we're just getting on this just kept knocking it down the line down the line and then after six months they finally just went yeah just like because of the pandemic because of other things like you know kind of like we're not doing this anymore oh, so cool. it, and i think that's it i think i think it was a case of like they had this scheme and within six months that scheme was kind of done because they realized that it didn't wasn't going to be what they thought it was going to be and so i just think that's the landscape at the moment is you just a lot of people have ideas not a lot of people necessarily know exactly how they want to make it work yeah jake i'd like to ask you so just to pick up on, on the point we heard earlier about the decline of packaged media and DVD, because DVD was a thoroughgoing boom and it, it was a god's end for independent film and, and sell through. But you're still in that space with, with um, Nucleus. Yes. Well, the thing with Nucleus films is, is that we release um, older films like cult classics, Euro horror, stuff like that. So you're releasing films which are generally, you know, we're trying to find stuff which we will then remaster and then we'll, we'll make extras. And, but these films are films which already have an audience. So, and they're, they're, the, the buyers of these films are people that like collecting. So we'll try and do like postcard sets and um, as many extras as possible, limited numbered editions, stuff like that. So the thing with physical media is that that's really becoming a kind of boutique collector space. And the difficulty, that doesn't translate for new filmmakers, though, because if you're a new filmmaker with your first films, right. you haven't got an audience for that. So no one's going to buy a Klex's edition of your film because no one's ever seen it. So if it's a film which was made in 1968, you know, like an Italian giallo, the people want to buy that still. And if it's remastered and they've not been able to see it for like 20, 30 years, then that's the, that's the kind of films that we're looking for. It's exactly what Arrow do. It's exactly what Indicator do. And there is a there's a thing in that space, but I don't think that's helpful for anyone here who's a filmmaker, though, because maybe in maybe in sort of 30, 40 years time, people will want a collector's edition of some of your work. But unfortunately, you've got to do you've got to do that. So physical media is alive, but it's like it's like vinyl, I would say. Yes. Yeah, I, th I think that's a very good observation. I mean, we so you, you had on the podcast, Giles, you had Alex Ferrari, who was the whole film entrepreneur aspect which which was about you know creating that extra value um 
for the horror genre, is is that still a thing? I mean, you know, the merch stall at Fright Fest is is absolutely buzzing. Is there an angle to approach it via merch or, or that kind of value? Or, or you're saying, Jake, it just wouldn't work for, for new stuff? And Any opinions, anyone? I, again, what Jake was saying is absolutely right. For new stuff, it's really hard to break through. But if you've got something cool that adds to your product, that pe- that stands out, because you've got, I don't know, your DVD covers, are, it's actually a werewolf that comes out, so it sticks, I don't know, whatever it is, mm-hmm. it's something different. And again, your distributor will probably say, no, you're not having that. But if you're doing it yourself or if you're promoting it, and that's why it's important to talk about get behind the scenes stuff, Anything you can get that can add on to your film that isn't just, hey, here's my film. Director's commentaries, cinematographer commentaries, behind the scenes. You do need it all now. The more you can have, the better. And if it's you doing a diary every time, you know, talking about how you actually made the film, raised the money, got it distributed. That's huge. People want to know that shit. People, filmmakers will buy it because of that, especially if it says that in the review. So you really do have to think, why should anyone want to watch my film? And it's what the guys have been saying. It's your story. It's key. And if your story's good enough, people go, oh, okay, I'll, now I fancy that. It's getting good reviews. And that's the hard bit, right? And obviously raising the money. But those those are really hard. Um, but yeah, I think you can. There are, there are many ways to do it. But I think it's, it's important to know what you're planning to do from the beginning and having that in mind and saying, this is my set out. And if you are making a short, great. Don't expect it to go on any channels. Don't expect it to make money. You're doing it to further your career. You're doing it because you want to test stuff out. You want to see what it's doing. And sure, go make a you know micro budget feature, but don't again expect that to to do necessarily well. Do it because you're learning, and hopefully something will happen from it. I think people get very disheartened when they've made something straight away and they go, "Why is it not blown up? Why is it not?" Well, because it takes time to do this stuff. It's not easy. You might not have had the right team. You might not be ready. Story wasn't ready. There's so many reasons, but you've got to really think about it from the beginning about why you're making this and who your audience is. Am I right in thinking as well that like there's a statistic out there that um, is about how <clears throat> a lot of people will make a first feature, but then they never make a second there's, one. It's, it's about, I think it's 85, 90% yeah. of people who so don't I make a second So I think it's just good feature. to be aware of that in a way because then you know that it's normal to feel disheartened because you put so much energy into it but i think Mm. you're right in a way you want to make something that you want to believe in i think that's absolutely important um but in a way you don't want to make your best idea first i guess or at least you don't want to because it's almost that element of killing your darlings, isn't it? Where you can't get too attached. Of course, you still have to be attached, but it's sort of like an art of sort of being in the middle of it and mm. still doing the work, but not getting too involved, I guess, because otherwise it can be soul crushing, I guess. Well, I don't totally know. It can be soul crushing either way, I think, but yeah, it just is. You only need one bad review and suddenly you you feel like absolute shit. It doesn't matter how many great ones you've had. I think that just, <laughs> it just goes with it, doesn't it? It's really part of it. Um, going back to sort of how things can go viral, I know it, like it's so unpredictable and nothing's guaranteed generally with marketing anyway, but there's certain examples that you can look at. Like there was the film Devil's Due um, that I really remember. You know, people have been doing gimmicks in marketing forever. Uh, you know, William Castle doing his sort of weird tingler stuff on the seats and, and things. Um, but Devil's Due, I remember they had this um, like this pram uh, with this demon baby in and like it, they just left it out there outside the cinema and people would go up and be like, oh my God, there's a pram. And like look in the pram and then this baby was like, come out and get them. And that totally went viral because people were like, this is so, such a cool promo. And I think that that probably helped with the marketing. And the thing is, obviously you can't rely on stuff like that, but maybe if you have a cool idea and especially in horror, you could use gimmicks like that to try and utilize the stuff we have at the moment the internet and the ability to get stuff out there like just try and if it doesn't work like it doesn't work but why not yeah i would just say in in terms of like um you know your your second or third film and sort of like having made your first and then finding yourself in the wilderness for several years after because you haven't been able to finance your film or nobody wanted to give you a job well, you know, I think the only way around that is just to keep on making films. Um, and the, the, the technology allows you to do that now. You can make films on a mobile phone. 
Um, so it, it's like the, the studio system. How do you make a successful film when you make seven of them and you hope that one works? Um, so, so you know, you, you have to go into it with the mentality of not making one film. Make seven. Make seven films over 10 years or, or over 20 years. Um, and, um, and that's really, you've, you've, you've got to look at the longer plan. Um, and then, you know, in terms of... Um, of sort of uh, you know sort of merchandise and sales and, and getting people to want to buy into your film, um, the key elements really are your poster, uh, your key art, um, and your trailer. It used to be key art first because with DVD that's what people would see on the on the supermarket shelf. Um, now it's more the trailer. Um, uh, those two elements have to be, you know, the dog's bollocks. And that's, that's really where a sales agent or a distributor will come into their realm because um, they're not um, too attached to the film as, as, or so attached to the film as you are. They're more objective. They know what works in the market and they'll know what to do with your film to make it work in the market. And you might look at what they're doing and go, oh my God, that's, that, that doesn't represent my film whatsoever. It doesn't matter as long as it gets bums on seats. You know, so that's really what a, a sales agent and a distributor does. And then the, the other thing is that, um, I mean, there was one French distributor that said to me, oh, I watch 40 films a day. And I said, well, how, how can you watch 40 films a day? Do you watch, like, f you know, and, and, and he said, well, actually, I only, I, you know, actually, I only buy from my friends, right? What, what he was saying is that he doesn't watch films that he buys. He relies on the on the sales agent and the sales agent's eye, the sales agent's ability, ability to spot a film, to watch a film and bring it to him and say, here's the poster, here's the trailer, give me five minutes of your time to, to digest these two elements and then buy the film. So, so there you've got three elements. You've got the poster, the trailer and the sales agent and his relationship with the distributor. Because there are so many films made, distributors do not have time to watch them. It's just content. What I will say from the um, the promo and the merch and the PR side of things is not just for Fright Fest, although um, uh, I've just selected the final feature for Fright Fest today, in fact. And then in about two weeks' time, I'll be emailing all of the directors and producers and blah, 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 and saying, look, if you want to make a splash at the festival, um, send us like 600 t-shirts to put in the goodie bag or a badge if you can't afford that or postcards or whatever. Just send something and sell it, not just to our audience, but to the world because lots of folks will be wearing your t-shirt if your short film or feature gets selected in not just Fright Fest, any bloody festival. Promote, promote, promote. Make stuff... Be there, be present, be present on Twitter, on Facebook. Promote your screening. If I select your film, Jake, this year, or maybe yours, Alex, who knows, whether these two will be in the festival. But I, I will say to them, get on Twitter, get on Facebook, get on Instagram, promote your festival, promote the screening, promote yourself, and make a badge, make a T-shirt, make a few T-shirts, give, make a load. Do you know what I mean? Retaliators that we world premiered last year, they sent us like 2,000 T-shirts, 2,000 caps, 2,000 of everything to give away to everybody going into that audience. And of course, the film then got bought off the back of the people going, I've, won, I've got my retaliator shirt and I've got my, you know, it makes well, a fucking it difference. <laughs> and badges, oh my God, here comes hell. One of my favorite low budget British black and white we did the world premiere in Glasgow with Jack. He made a couple of hundred badges, which I still wear on my jacket if it wasn't so bloody hot in here. So um, just if you can't afford 2,000 caps, blah, 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 do it on the, the social media or make a couple of hundred badges. You made badges for your world premiere at Fry Fest last year. <laughs> and they were the smallest badges, but I've still got it. Yeah. They are, like, they're so military. You have to like a magnifying glass. I didn't and, I'm, like, know. and it's still they really cool. cool. It's like a little videotape. To find it's like, them. It's like tiny, know, like a microscopic. Footage. So right. look, guerrilla marketing costs either nothing or very little, but just fucking do it, man. I, I was going to say as well, I picked up a sticker at Fright Fest last year for crabs and it's on my laptop crabs. and I look yeah. at it all the time and I'm like, it's great logo, it's great everything. It just reminds you of 
everything. It's great. And it's so important. I got a t-shirt through as a crowdfunder. I put some money. I didn't know them, but I just liked what they had, what they were talking about with their um, their film. And they sent me, it, it booked a t-shirt. I was, it was t- but this t-shirt was fucking ace. I, I thought oh, I might be wearing tonight, but it is one of those things that you go, I'll probably wear that at other festivals or uh, all this stuff, retaliate stuff. People wear it forever if it's cool yeah. so again make sure when you it's not just hey it's just your logo your name or whatever on it it's actually make something that's cool yeah here comes hell, yeah, here comes hell. Well, it's something it's that makes a difference it's so important well and and like on that note too it was like uh, even fright fest last year our uh, we were part of a anthology feature that was shot during the pandemic and our producer just like called us up like a week beforehand was like uh uh can you get like a bunch of people together to wear hazmat suits and hand out uh mm-hmm. hand out uh flyers in front of fright fest and so if you saw someone in a hazmat suit outside fright fest last year it was uh it was this one right here <laughs> <laughs> very sweaty you did I, yeah <laughs> very sweaty. just want to add add something to this if you don't have a budget and you therefore don't have a cast then what do you need in 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 your ingredients in your project to to to, to, to <laughs> find an audience yeah um i would say there's two things one is possibly uh, sensationalism um and for example i represented a film 10 years ago called a serbian film the whole world, the whole film, the whole world was talking about that film. I didn't need to sell it, it sold itself, <laughs> right? And then on the other hand is something that is zeitgeisty. You know, so coming up with a seance online during lockdown host was very zeitgeisty. You know, so, so um, you know, the, 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 it, that's difficult because it's timing. You'll, you, you know, you'll come up with an idea and three years later it won't be so zeitgeist, zeitgeisty when it gets released but um that those are two things that you can have ingredients you can have in your film where you don't have a budget or you don't have a cast well that's definitely true with the serbian film because actually that killed the idea of sensationalism i think it was too it was too much and nobody did anything that topped that ever again <laughs> so yeah may, maybe don't do that <laughs> Well, he hasn't made a film since. So. <laughs> Thank God for that. So this is this is fantastic, and I mean, you know, horror has always had that kind of carnival showmanship. What else can can we kind of do uh, as as filmmakers to to get it out there and get people aware and get people talking? And I, you know, I guess that's a question for everybody. I'm going to open to the floor in a second. Um, how can we animate? people who love horror film, people who love the genre. How can we find them? How can we contact them? How can we engage them? How can we animate them? Well, there's plenty of um, uh, horror channels, of Facebook uh, horror fan pages. There's so many that you can tap into and do it now if you're making a horror film. Get involved now. Start commenting on people who are saying what their favorite films are. So important. Reddit's still a real thing and it's still a place where you can talk to like-minded people. Festival's so important to chat there. and uh, there, is, there are so many, but you've got to do the work. That's the hard bit. You've got to put the time and effort in to actually do, no one else will do it for you. Even if you did get Jinga Films with Julian or you got another sales distributor, don't expect them to do everything. You still should be thinking you haven't got one. You need to be doing everything. If you can afford a PR company, 100%. Again, it's money, it's really hard. But you've got to think, how can I get the word out about my film? And you've just got to think, watch what other people have done. Uh, and see how they did theirs. Why were they a success? Why was Host a success? Why was Blair Witch a success? They had the website, okay, and they were clever with it. Don't know, you've got to think outside the box, and it's really hard. None of us have necessarily succeeded massively at that. It's really difficult. So maybe you can, (coughs) maybe you can. I think collaboration helps. Um, I think that obviously film is very collaborative in general, but, really just like getting out there and like you were saying networking and stuff like that it sounds so cheesy like every (sighs) industry you need to do networking but you really do and then you meet people who are who maybe can help you with your project or whatever vice versa you can help them and then things like that happen and that's never going to happen if you don't go out and meet people so going to stuff like fright fest i guess <laughs> it's so important if you mention your film to filmmaker at fright fest they'll go oh yeah i want to see that and i tell you what word of mouth is one of the biggest 
tools in your toolbox. Word of mouth is massive. It, it is, you know, you, you're at Fright Fest or whichever festival you're at, someone says, oh, that's got a show in so-and-so. I saw it last week. There's all those type of things that's so important to get word out and keep doing that forever. You've got to keep, keep thinking outside the box. One, I, I can definitely attest that, um, you know, in my short and minimal amount of success um, is that it's like, one of the things that I really learned is that I had this mentality that I refer to as the underpants gnome mentality. Whereas like, I don't know if anyone's ever seen South Park with the underpants gnomes, but they have the whole plan system of like, first we steal the underpants, then there's step two, then we make profit. And I think that was my problem is I was like, okay, I'm gonna make the film and then, you know, it's gonna be a success at some point. You know, it'll just like, and you, you don't think, you don't think like, oh, I'll just stick it up on YouTube and then everyone will like watch it. And then you look at it the next day and it has 10 views and you're like, wait, why has nobody, why, why hasn't this gone viral? And it's, and you know, it, it, it is like, it took, it took me way too long to realize that you have to go to events, you have to meet people, you have to talk to people, you have to tell them why your film is interesting, why you should care, why you should, and then people will, they'll be like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll check out your film. I mean, especially it really helps if your film is four minutes and 20 seconds and then you could be like, <laughs> It won't, it won't take you that long. Just, but you know, but that's, that's the thing is like, I think like I learned way too late that networking is a big, big part of this. So that would be the big thing is even though like I'm probably, we are the least successful people here um, on this panel. I would say that that would be the one piece of advice I could definitely give people. I think from the horror perspective, if you're, if you want to make horror films and you, I'm assuming a lot of you guys want to make horror movies and do. The good thing is, is that the horror community is there. It exists. It's not a community that you have to build yourself. It's something you can tap into from Fright Fest to through to like online forums. Like, you know, even if you just go to like Arrow Video or, or my page, Nicholas Films, you've got people talking about horror films. The, the community is there. So you've already got it. I mean, it's a Google search away. So it's not, it's, there's no mystery about how to get to talk to people. So I think the the good thing is is that it's there and the thing about like julian said about trying to tap into a zeitgeist I, I don't think that's really possible because no one knows what the zeitgeist is you know if you're lucky enough to do with something that chuck yeah well if but 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 once again as a as a filmmaker he's not tapping into the zeitgeist for every film he does so i think the thing is is that I, I interviewed the, the creators of the Blair Witch Project on the, for the, video, the UK video release. And, one of the, and they were sh as shell-shocked and surprised that it was a big hit as anybody else. They basically couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe that it was being marketed, that this, this film that they shot for essentially $12,000 on video with actors shooting, getting the actors to even shoot the thing. You know, they couldn't believe that that had become a success. So they were, it's not, they, did, they, they didn't plan it. They, they didn't plan having websites and stuff like that. But what they did plan is that they worked out a really good mythology for their story. And that's what everyone else could tap into. So that's the thing. You've got to get, that's, that's the shit you've got to get together. And then other people can help you do websites and posters and all the rest of it. So like I say, I always go back to just creating the best thing that you can to start off with that's fair like do something that inspires others like whether to help you or just inspire in general i definitely get that yeah that makes sense i mean i think it is possible to tap into the zeitgeist i think hosts and <laughs> and howard's film uh, uh, lockdown ha hauntings were examples of two filmmakers who suddenly find themselves out of work for two years who thought well, how how do i deal with this situation you know um, let's make a film about, you know, sort of being in lockdown and being haunted. I mean, they, 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 there's two of them. There's probably like several of them. They, you know, I, I sort of lot a lot of lockdown films that came in. I thought, oh, my God, not another lockdown film. Um, but those two cut through. And I think the filmmakers jumped on the opportunity that they realized that the whole world was going through this. And therefore, if they come up with an idea in that context, they could make it work. It's like, I suppose. So. But then, you know, on the other hand, you, you can get a film like Colin's 50 pound zombie film, um, uh, you know, which uh, every UK distributor turned down until the sales agent took it to Cannes during austerity. And somebody jumped on the idea that this was an austerity zombie film, <laughs> you know, and, and all the national newspapers covered it. Kaleidoscope turned it down three times until they, they came back from Cannes and opened up every national newspaper and there was a double page spread about this austerity 50 pound zombie film. And then they were like, oh, you know, all the marketing's been done for us. We'll buy the film. So it's like, you, you couldn't have predicted that. It, it, it just, it just it, that's timing. But, but uh, Mark V. Price there, yeah. He, he, I think, I suppose the important thing as well is 
money. Where do we get the money? Like Mark's film there made for whatever, we say 50 quid. There we go, 57 pound 50. But it's true, where do we find the money? I suppose that's the most important thing. Well, sort of one of the, we can all potentially write a script, we can all shoot one. But where do we find the money? And that's, you know, one of the hardest bits about it. But it's doable. We've all done it. We've done it here. You can find the money. You can do it. Crowdfunding is a is an actual way to go these days. Um, and then, like they were saying before, cast. Julian was saying, if you can get a decent cast member, you can maybe get a sales estimates, or maybe you'll find an investor that way because you've got a cast member. Um, but maybe other people will talk about money as well. But yes, I mean, this evening, the way this evening seems to have panned out such a depth of knowledge and such a fantastic panel and such a large panel uh we haven't even really touched on funding um i'm equally conscious that it's really warm in here yes. and i don't want this to <laughs> yes. necessarily turn into one of ah uh, i don't want this to turn into one of giles's events that goes on for about 14 hours it's like shower or something um so what i'm gonna do is i'll open this up First of all, I'm going to say, if, if everybody's enjoyed it, we, we'll solicit feedback afterwards and we might try and make this like a regular thing for people working in the genre space and filmmakers and just to get together and, and have a bit of that festival vibe. So maybe we'll do something very, very specific on financing coming down the line. But in order to get out, everybody you know, out of here and rehydrated, let's, let's go to the floor for some questions. That chap there with, with the Evil Dead t-shirt on. Hello. Um, yes, having made my uh, very own rubber puppet alien, Evil Aliens uh, film recently, going on the good lad. Uh, the question really is: Is there space for weird niche films still? It feels like on streaming services, it's kind of the same thing over and over. Do we think there's room for that niche? Two words: fuck yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The sadness. Yes. The sadness yes. is a good example. Yeah. I think. I, I think. Are you talking short or feature? Are you talking weirdness short? Short. So I watched a short last night, which was the weirdest, most brilliant thing I've ever seen. Taken them years to make. It's really strange. Found footage mixed with everything, everything, everything. Weirdest thing I've ever seen. I emailed them last night. I said it's in for Fright Fest. It's going to play on the IMAX. End of story. Weird is good, but make it good. <laughs> But, but I think the, to answer your question as well, quick, really briefly, the thing is, is to, to not keep on rerunning what everyone else has done. So you've got to kind of come in at an angle where you're trying to, you're, obviously you love gore, splatter, horror, etc. cetera, but you, how you, what lens are you going to put that through? Because the thing with Evil Aliens, it was basically, it's like, how could I, what, what could I add to doing a kind of evil deadish kind of idea with a different kind of, that aren't, that aren't zombies or undead. So it was the alien thing which made that kind of interesting and the fact that they were evil so they had no moral fiber at all. So therefore there was no, there was no deep kind of con connection with that. But then it was about this, you know, like a team of, of uh, journalists, basically they had, they had arrived on the island because they, they didn't believe in anything and they were gonna make up a story anyway. So what happens to them is even worse than they can make up. So that was the angle I came in it. So I think you just need to look for something where where your story isn't just a rerun of going to a cabin in the woods. And I think that's because we've seen that story too many times. Yeah, I'd say lots of things actually are um, doing the same thing over and over again because that the streaming services, for example, need content. And it's only when they get something original, they would totally buy that as well, but they're just not getting it. So if you've got something original, totally go make it. I'm sure it would sell just as well, I'm sure. People want good original stuff, right? Yeah, totally agree. People are always looking for new stuff. I don't think there's ever going to be, a, you know, there's so much content right now, but I don't think that matters. If, if yours is good, it will get seen. People don't mind. People want to see. I want to see a puppet movie. Do you know what I mean? So I, I think that there is space for it. I, I think everyone here is saying the same thing. I think there is space. I mean, Julia, maybe you've got an opinion here because obviously you get sent a lot of films a lot. Is the too much? Uh, um, you know, it, it's, it, it, it would be difficult to sell a puppet film to the horror market. Um, so... Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, it's true. That's that's an example. It's just it's it, it, it's just that the, the, the distributors are looking for reasons to say no, and when they, you know, it's it, it's like animation within the horror mar market. Who's the audience? You think of puppets are, are really for for kids, and the and the horror market is young adult and and um, and older. But it's it's 
it's, it, it's immediately a reason for a distributor to say no. Um, but the only way to cut through that, I mean, all these rules are there to be broken. The only way to cut through is to do something like a Peter Jackson, an early Peter Jackson film, or an early Sam Raimi film, where it's so out to lunch, you know, that that everybody just goes, this has to be seen. Like, what's the Welsh guy that um, that, 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 that the Chuck Chuck Steele stuff, you know? Oh, um, yes. Yeah, I, I, I mean, he's he's got a market, so yes, I mean, I think that um, that that um, it, it's doable if you do it the right way. Okay, next question. Yep, uh, in there in the yellow. Well, I went and saw Isolation because I met Alex in her hazmat suit. That's true. Yeah. 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 So it's worth doing. Also, Jake, the tour has had over 300,000 views on YouTube and made about $100 off of it. Mm. <laughs> That's wow. not a lot of money. Yeah, no, it's, which is tough for filmmakers, I really feel for that. So, for me, the question here for you guys is partly from an experience I had when I showed the tour at Screenfest. Um, I met a producer at the bar, we started talking, he saw the tour, he liked it, he said to me, what's your next idea? I didn't know. I said, oh, the tour is a feature, he said, pitch it to me. I didn't have anything. So where would you say in terms of advice for, if you've made something, you're going onto the market, you're going into the festival circuit, always having something in your back pocket in case you have that conversation. A hundred percent. Yeah, I'd say have, I mean, I don't know about other filmmakers here, but there's, there must be 10 projects I'm working on right now. And there's always something that's leading the charge. But then if you're speaking to a certain distributor and they're like horror, for instance, you're going, cool, I've got this horror or there's this I'm working on. I don't know. I think it's really important because they, they were interested in you and they were saying, cool, I want to know what's next. And therefore you've got to be ready to go, I've got this. I think it's really important to have stuff, whether it's real or not, or you can make it up on the spot. I don't think it matters. I think you just have to have, they're interested in you. That's the, you've won. Do you see know what I mean? That's where you're winning now. They go, great, you can now send an email the next week and say, here's my script, here's my deck pitch, whatever you do. I think it's really important, my side. Bro, I, I, I really feel you. Cause like I had the exact same situation where I uh, had, um, Retch was going around and we, got like a bunch of emails through from people going like, Oh, loved wretch. What, what's the, what's the feature version of that? And I was like, I didn't think it's just like, it's like a fun ride with a gag at the end. I didn't really think about like, how, how do you make that into a film? And so, you know, it was that painful thing of like, I, I, I tried to throw together a concept. I went to a meeting with uh, gunpowder sky in LA and they just sat there and I went like, this doesn't feel like the film at all. And I was just kind of like, well, it's cause I'd like Jerry rigged it. Basically. I tried to like, <laughs> kind of like come up with something that technically is wretch but really isn't and it's just like so it's like so that's been my ethos from now on is like like i need to be ready so it's like you know i have i have you want you want yeah, you, sure. you, i just want to take a, a lot of writing happened over the pandemic right. um <laughs> so now we have you know a pitch but basically seven pitch decks and also spec scripts are super important i know you don't necessarily want to write but as soon as you start talking about features they're going to be like yeah well a deck might not be quite enough we want to know what your writing style is like in a longer form mm -hmm. so even if you're just doing one to show like what you're all about that's that's something we've definitely learned i think um and we wish we'd known it sooner so yeah no i mean i think that's it it's like and you know for me i don't know and this is like me like completely potentially bullshitting here but you know but i'm, I'm also like trying to look at it from the standpoint of like okay this is my film that like this like you know, budgeted like five million. This is a film that I could make for like two hundred grand. This is a film. This is more like a, a sort of like um, uh, this is my slasher film. This is my more kind of um, horror, comedy. horror comedy. I really want to make a film about horror, a horror film set at Thanksgiving because it's just really not been covered enough. Um, but you know, it's so yeah. I mean, that's that's kind of it. Is like we are like trying as much as we are like putting our sweat, blood, and tears into trying to make this really super low budget feature uh, with all the passion and gumption and duct tape we can. It's like a case of at the same time is I'm like okay what's the next step are we going to be ready when somebody likes this film for us to be able to say okay well we have this don't like that what about this don't like that what about this yeah maybe you know that's that's our strategy at the we moment maybe. yeah we can, we can work with maybe, with maybe. The, the one thing that you'll learn when you get your films into film festivals is that whenever you do a q a mm. pull whoever's doing the q a the question will always come up 
what's your next project? So basically, it's good to have something in mind that you want to do for that. But bear in mind, though, whatever your next project is, even if it's a low budget thing or a big budget thing, it's going to take at least a year or so of your life. So make sure you like the idea. Don't be pitching something that is shit. <laughs> All my ideas are golden. <laughs> good, obviously. Rich, the feature. Yeah, no, uh, well. I mean, it's a really good idea. It's just not a good idea for a rich feature. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh. Go on. Yeah, just, uh, quick, um, budgets as well. Don't be afraid to have different budgets. You know, it depends who you're talking to. You can make this for 20 quid. You can make it for 200 grand. You can make it for 2 mil. Of course you could. It's your filmmakers. You have to do think like that. But yeah, have those in the back of your mind, depending on who you're talking to. No try to know who you're talking to, what films they've made at certain budgets levels so that you can come in at the same price so you don't price yourself out or too low. It's really important because well, they will ask you. So it's these kind of things you do need to be ahead of the game about. Yeah, so you, you never know when an opportunity is going to come your way. And you better make damn sure that when it does come your way, you're ready because there'll be another thousand filmmakers who are competing for that opportunity. So you've got to be, um, you've got to have a project that is basically ready to be greenlit. And that means a lot of development, you know, 10 drafts or whatever. Um, so it's basically ready to roll. Um, this, hap this happened to me two years ago, just before lockdown. Uh, I had a random email from India. Um, and it was the biggest Indian broadcaster, ZTV. And they said, we want to make th three horror films in Eastern Europe um, for uh, a, a million pounds each or a million do dollars each. Have you got anything? So um, I, I, dug, I dug a script out of my bottom drawer that I'd had for 10 years and I sent it to them. And, and the reason why I sent that one was because it was the most developed. It was ready to go. I had like 10 other projects that were sort of neither here nor there. Um, but that was the one that I thought, well, this, this is ready to go. So um, two weeks later, they arranged a meeting with me in London. And uh, um, a month or two later, I was in Tbilisi, Georgia, shooting the film. Um, so you know that's, that's really, they, they say being a soldier is boring because you never go to war. Fil filmmaking is similar in the sense that you spend 90% of your, your time developing and hustling and, 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 and you know, very small amount of your time actually making films. Fantastic. Sierra in the front there. Just wait for the mic. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I have a unique predicament, and I'm hoping that one of you will have insight, which is I currently have a fairly substantial platform online. So I have a TikTok account with about 170,000 followers and a YouTube channel as well. And I'm currently in post-production on a horror project that could either be a 20-minute short or 10 two-ish minute episodes. And I'm not really sure what to do with it because the audience I've cultivated elsewhere is um, educational content that's pretty child friendly. So something being like, here kids, <laughs> seems like the wrong way to go along with sort of community guidelines, violations, etc. Um, but I think it is something that's fairly zeitgeisty. It's horror with a twist. Basically, the premise is this young woman um, commits suicide, as one does. And instead of dying, she gets possessed by a demon. And then the twist is the demon makes every aspect of her life better. So instead of it being a negative thing, like we've got to exercise the demon, she gets like a promotion at work because she's more assertive now. And she gets cat called one night and that never happens again. <laughs> she just kills the guy. And it's kind of a sort of, it's a twist on some genre of calls. And I'm not sure what to do with it. And I appreciate your advice. Is this a live action? Yeah, so it's in post production now, getting um, all the VFX and stuff. Uh, to pitch it to companies like Shudder and and Screenbox. Um, Screenbox. Yeah, yeah, because you know they are that they're. Effect I mean, SVOD is effectively television online. You know, so they're they're going to be wanting more episodic. Um, so that that might be a direction that they would be looking to go in. Are you saying that your um, online base is kid stuff? It's kind of, well, no, it's ages like 13 and up, but it's quite upbeat and That's happy. That's horror. Yeah, I, it's, it's, it's like, it's a lot of, Eight and up? It's a lot of, <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of puberty stuff that I do, so the 
TikTok channel is called Callahan's Questions, and anyone can send me an anonymous question, and it's a lot of like, is my body normal? And the answer is either, yeah, you're fine, or oh god, see a doctor. Um, so I guess maybe you can't use your platform for that then. It no, it doesn't seem like the right... So maybe it's just like completely, yeah, not, on, not helpful really, I guess. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So just back... Back down to as if you had no, no platform. <laughs> I would say that if you want to learn how Sierra got to that many TikTok subscribers, you can find again a, a fantastic seminar on our YouTube channel, uh, which you recorded for us. So come yeah, have a could, look at that. You could start a horror TikTok and then tell all your followers, like, if you like horror, yeah, yeah, come yeah. over to my TikTok. Yeah. 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 Very good. Okay. Next, uh, where are we going? Uh, chap, chap there with the black shirt, and then we'll come to you next. Um, so, suggestions on if you've got a successful short, you're in the feature, you've got your treatment, there's a tiny bit of buzz, like the shorts play in many festivals, one festivals. What's your advice on that when you've sort of got a package ready to go, but you don't have an agent? Like, what's the sort of steps? And you've done everything that would probably be in the I think uh, places like IMDb are perfect these days to seek out the right producer for you and by getting the team around you will really help. You've got your short, right? It's it's out. You've now written the feature. That's correct. Is that so right? What and you're is ready. your short? What was your short? Is it? What is um, it? Like you want to know what it's about? Or no, what's it called? Oh, it's called Eject. The Jet. The Jet. Eject. 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 What, so where's it played? Where, where have you screened? Uh, it's played at Sidges. It's played, it's, it's played at many festivals. It's, okay. like out, it's played at over 35 festivals. And nice. Like about eight festivals. Okay. And a couple of competitions as well. And it's got like, it's, it's, it was on Amaletto as well. Okay. Um, but it's the whole, you know, many filmmakers are probably facing the same thing. It's getting a producer. Mm. Because most producers probably what have like ten or fifteen films on their slates, and they follow the one that really get you know launched. Mm. So I've had yeah. it so many times where you're developing it with a producer, but they're not really bringing anything. You do the things that point to BFI or all the other schemes, but it doesn't go anywhere. So you, go so you sound a bit disillusioned. <laughs> no, I've pretty much done everything. No, no, but I mean you sound disillusioned with. You know, when you're saying, I've done the short, yeah. it's done really well, yeah. blah, blah, blah. And you sound a bit like, I don't know, upset or something oh, no, about going I've forward. I've through it quite a lot. So what I'm doing now is while trying to still do that, I'm, you know, uh, developing my own micro feature and trying to get that. So what have, where, where have you got that? Have you got, is it script? Have you uh, got yeah. cast? So second draft treatment, got a little bit of funding of around like 10K. Mm. So it's basically getting to the next level while like Giles, I'll have many other things going on in the background. I've just finished my new show and that's going to festivals, but I've said to myself, that's, thank you. I've said to myself, that's the last show I'm doing because I've done a lot of shorts. And yeah. But shorts are, shorts are a great breeding ground. Oh, absolutely. Ground. Both, um, my know. suggestion to you would be make a feature and make it fucking good. That's what I'm trying to do. But Don't make it shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's what right. I'm trying to do. There's only so much you can do when you feel like you're by yourself. And like mm. I say, producers, I've had a board, and because they've had 10 or 15 other projects, they'll follow the one that's taken off. It can it can be really lonely. There's no question about oh, it. When you're that person trying to do everything, I was there. It's really lonely. I think you've just got to kiss enough frogs yeah. as you go through <laughs> with these producers. It is. It's finding like say if they go off for another project, cool, be be all right to go. Cool, you go off and do that. I'm going to find another producer right now, or stick with them because eventually it might come back to you. But you, there's only you can make that choice. Mm -hmm. But then make sure you choosing the right producer or the right team because technically you're producing as well so make sure that they really believe in the project they give us try and give as much as shit as you do but also uh that they they have delivered before a lot of producers do say they've delivered and they haven't so just do your homework it's imdb it's there it's real yeah. it says whether they've actually put a film out rather than them just talking shit um i'll talk to you more about it as well we give some more about it. i know, I know. Very good. it it sounds to me like you're doing the right thing by having a plan a plan b and it might be that you make your plan b first yeah. you know um what's what would you say the budget of your plan a is um is that 
Um, but, oh yeah, it would. The reason why I'm going to do the micro feature is because the plan A require a slightly larger budget. Nothing like too huge, but something that I couldn't get because I haven't made because I haven't done the first feature yet. So yeah. The idea of writing the micro budget is, oh, I could try and do this for like maybe fifty to a hundred k, and because my shorts have done quite well, I can hopefully attract that. But the 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 eject feature, for example, I'd imagine would be past a million, whereas the micro feature may be between 50 and 100k. But that's obviously pulling in a lot of favours, maybe people work for free, as on the shorts, but yeah. each is obviously demanding a lot more because it's three weeks as opposed to two days. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, I, I would struggle to raise a million for a, for a horror feature in today's mar market, you know, um, and that's nine, nine features down the road. Um, so uh, it's it, it, it'd be good to focus on your 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 micro and do that and just find a way to to get it done by any means necessary. Yeah, cool. Totally agree with Julian. Cheers, guys. Okay, um, in the front there. My question is about casting. Um, I wonder how you cast your films. Do you usually use the
Hi, I'm Keir Seward, director of the grotesque hit horror short, Wretch. <laughs> Currently streaming on Alter and Bloody Disgusting TV. And I'm Alex Austin, the director of the upcoming Mutant Leech short, Sucker. We're a married couple, and we're currently joining forces as AK. And together we're creating our first ever feature film, a gnarly body horror called Kill Your Lover. So the film is about Dakota. A former punk rocker who is trapped in a relationship with a boring guy who just does not get her. Actually, the film is about Axel, a caring and empathetic guy who's underappreciated by his self-absorbed partner, Dakota. I mean, she just wants to break up with him because he just doesn't understand her. And he's trying to work on their relationship and fight for it. So we jump backwards and forwards in their relationship and we see how bit by bit he keeps trying to change her. Well, more like he's trying to help her and she's perpetually self-destructive. Okay, but most importantly, this is a body horror film. So it's really about how the more Dakota tries to break up with Axel, the more that he starts to transform into a violent, toxic creature. Okay, yes, he does do that, but breakups aren't easy on anyone. Picture the grotesque body horror of the fly, Titan Society. Mixed with strong dramatic performances like Blue Valentine, Possession, and Before Midnight. Since we first started working together almost a decade ago, we've developed a strong kinetic style with an attention to set pieces, strong visuals, and pacey editing. But we also ground that in nuanced performances with flawed, complex characters. As big horror fans, we are all about the sickening practical effects, and that's a big part of why we want to make this movie. I mean, Keir loves the thing so much, he got it tattooed on his arm. Our fantastic special effects makeup artist Rebecca Wheeler has worked on films such as Aquaman 2 and Boiling Point. She's at the ready to launch into making some amazing looks, helping to create those incredible kills. And we got a range of awesome perks on offer. There's immediately available perks like a secret screener of our latest horror short, Do Not Resuscitate, about a couple of paramedics who get a distress call and find a body that is not quite as dead as it initially appears. Limited time and exclusive perks such as naming a character in the film. Or have a photo session shot by either Alex or I. It could be for yourself or as a present for a friend. And, of course, the opportunity to see the film in all its glory with the cast and crew. Basically, what we want to do is we want to create a mind-melting experience. High impact, kick-ass, with a devastating relationship at its core. So, what are you waiting for? Show that pledge button who's boss. With your help, we can make something truly unique. Thank you so much for your support. We can't wait to get started.